the reason for a land acknowledgement prior to my podcast is to acknowledge my presence on the traditional lands of our First Nations peoples. It was a practice by First Nations people when traveling through other nations' territories as a sign of respect. Land Acknowledgement I acknowledge that the city of Hamilton, where I record this podcast, is situated upon the traditional territories of the Erie, Neutral, Huron-Wendat, Haudenosaunee, and Mississaugas. Hamilton is also directly adjacent to the Haldeman Treaty Territory. It is home to many Indigenous peoples from across Turtle Island, and this land acknowledgement is a small gesture to recognize the rich history of this land and so that I can better understand my role as a settler as well as a neighbor, partner, and caretaker. I stand in solidarity with the murdered and missing Indigenous women, girls, transgender, and two-spirited people, and all those that fight for justice on their behalf. Miigwech. Thank you. Welcome to the arena, where sometimes the hardest part is showing up. My name is Linda McLaughlin. Thank you for being here. Jewel's story is one of immense resilience, having overcome the sudden and shocking death of her partner, Trent, at the age of 46. She wrote about that experience in her blog, which then became a book called Sweet Baby Lover. But there's much more to her story. Thank you for listening. This is episode 29. Thank you so much for agreeing to be on my podcast. I'm I'm so excited to speak to you. I feel like I've known you for m- many months and yet we've never actually sat down and just had a conversation together and so I'm I'm grateful. I am too. I've been looking forward to it and I think it's because I hear you on your podcast. So it feels like I know you better than I really do. So we've interacted online and through podcasts but we've never had a live face to face. So I'm very grateful for this and happy to be here. As you probably know, I, I've got these little introductions that I do for people. And so without further ado, and before I do that, I have to say just in doing a bit of background work on you and listening to some other podcasts that you've been on, you're an impressive woman. Thank you. I appreciate you being with us. Jewel Kachera, you're a daughter. And do you have any siblings? I'm pausing because I once answered that question, no. And then I said... <laughs> Oh, oh, wait a minute. I have a brother. <laughs> oh. Which, yeah, I have a brother. All right. And you live in Cincinnati with your rescued greyhound, Lita. I did. She passed away in December. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry to laugh, but I'm batting a thousand here. Oh, my goodness. I'm so sorry to hear that. I lost a dog in, gosh, when was that? November the 10th. Oh, it's hard, isn't it? How Our long babies. have you been together? We had Jake for, gosh, how old was he? He was 11. And it was his fifth home. He was four months old by the time he came to Paul, and it was his fifth home. Yeah, Jake was yeah, was with us for a long time, but he was always baby Jake. He never got out of that very vulnerable puppy stage of his life. How, do, how about Lita? How long was she with you? I adopted her when she was four. She was a greyhound, and she mm, came off the mm-hmm. track. And like Jake... She, it took her a little while to adjust because they're just, they come to you so wounded. And, uh, but she was a sweetheart. We had a nice departure. It was a, her exit was actually a beautiful experience in a very sad way. Hmm. I'm sorry about your loss. I'm sorry about yours. (laughs) You're an author, podcaster, and educator. And after a successful 30-year career, you now spend your days doing what you used to do only on nights and weekends. True. (laughs) You blog at jewelkachera.com. Your podcast is Hard Times and Hope. And you teach part-time at the University of Cincinnati. You're in the Department of Management. Yes, I am. Business school. And you are... Also the volunteer board secretary for Home Base, which I understand is an umbrella organization in Cincinnati that supports community development organizations strengthening their communities through housing and economic development. That's true. (laughs) And after publishing your memoir, Sweet Baby Lover, you are also working on your first novel. Welcome to the arena, Jewel. Thank you, Linda. 
I always listen to your guests and they always sound a little bit taken aback after you read the introduction. <laughs> and I feel the same way. It's, oh yeah, that's right. I do that. So thank you for doing that research and affirming me in that way. We just mm -hmm. talked about our dogs and the memoir. I actually thought I was writing a biography mm. about my husband who passed away, but it, you're right. It was a memoir and spoiler alert, he dies. Yes, I listened to the podcast that you did on Mortality Minded, which was an amazing interview. I thought Thomas did a, an incredible job interviewing you, and it gave me such a deep background on you and the many things that, that you've done and, and that you've been through. And then, of course, I've listened to your own podcast and especially the interview that you did of yourself, which I thought mm -hmm. was a really amazing way to do it. Yeah. Thank you for listening to both of those. That interview with Thomas, the questions he asked, you heard it. So that's a conversation that goes deeper than almost any I've had with anyone about Trent's passing. And the same with the one about my interview with myself, about my thoughts of suicide when I was 15. That's not something I I talk about. <laughs> I just don't. Mm -hmm. Take me back to dinner conversation when you were growing up? This is funny because it should be your first easy question, right? This is the easy question. I know it's not. It, it's actually <laughs> so. not. No. <laughs> I was like, okay, here we go. Here's that question. And I have a sense of what it might be, although I don't know that part of your story. Yeah. So the answer is when I realized that you were going to be asking me the questions, I thought, oh, I should listen again and get write each question down. And you asked that that first dinner conversation question, it's hard to answer that question because it depended on if my dad was there or not. And he often, more often was not there. And if he was not there, then we didn't really talk and didn't necessarily eat together. But if he was there, he was like the sun and we were the satellites that revolved around him. My dad was bipolar or mm. I had bipolar disorder and self-medicated with alcohol. So he was either fascinating, captivating, charismatic, or he was frightening. And so with dinner, that's where it showed up. And you just never knew. I was always glad when he was there because my mom was always happy to see him. But I never knew which dad it was going to be. So dinner was always nervous. But we had some great conversations and some awful ones. Mm. And that obviously had a, a lasting and profound impact on you living in that environment and coping in that environment, learning how to duck and dive within that context. Duck and dive is a great way to put it. Yeah. Thank you for your recognition, appreciation of what that was like. So thank you. Yes. Mm -hmm. It shaped who I am. And what, in air quotes, skills do you think you developed in that environment. I'm thinking about your career in management. You were in the HR area. So those coping mechanisms were learned very young. Mm -hmm. Yeah. One of my, probably my most profound one is that I'm hyper vigilant. So mm -hmm. I'm very aware it on the plus side, it makes me empathic because I'm very aware of people's feelings. But on the downside, it's like a nervousness that doesn't go away. I hope that's fading, but I don't know. My dad is a brilliant man. His IQ is off the charts. So he was, he's passed away and he passed some of that along to me. So it made me smart. My career started out in the learning arena. I was in learning and development. So designing training programs, learning experiences for adults and corporations. And in that role, I had to learn whatever the content was very quickly and be able to speak with the subject matter expert about it. And I'm grateful for my brain that could do that. I also learned, and I, this is a skill that isn't helpful, or maybe it can be in some ways, but it's hurt me more than helped me. But I can pretend to be anything. I can pretend to be almost anyone. And I do believe that's everything wrong with my first marriage. Not everything, but whatever. That's a big part of, if I was really being me and not pretending to be somebody else, we never would have gotten married. Mm. The fitting in, like you say, just being able to behave in whatever way was going to make it okay. Yeah. And most of the okay was being mute and being quiet and out of sight. So the good part of that is I spent a lot of time doing two things. One, reading 
So I love to read and I would escape into books or I would escape into nature and go for long walks outside. And those two things I still value. And I'm grateful that I value nature and, and books. What event in your life has had the most profound impact on you? That's an interesting question because a few years ago, I would have thought it was transpassing, but then I thought, no, maybe it's my parents' divorce. No, maybe it's, and I realized it's actually everything about the situation or the family I was born into. So the blessings and the curses of that family, I was born a woman that shaped me. I was born white and with the 99% privilege that entails, I was born able-bodied. All the things that I was given at birth have shaped me more than anything. I thought about you today when I was walking and listening to the Mortality Minded interview again, just to have it top of mind. And may I ask you about your daily commitment to yourself to live? Oh, sure. What touched in me is something that that I feel myself, that in the last three years since I blew up my life in 2018, that my commitment to going through all of that was a, a recommitment to life mm -hmm. that I didn't realize I was making until more recently. Your interview of yourself was extremely moving. The gentleness with which you spoke to yourself, your 15-year-old self, and the way that you spoke about that daily commitment to getting up and, and living. Every day is a, an opportunity to live, very much like sobriety or anything like that. It's that recommitment every day to try again. I appreciate you sharing what motivates you to ask that because of the commonality there. What happened with me was when I started doing these podcasts and people were sharing their stories, I thought I haven't shared the most vulnerable story, the one I have kept quiet because of shame. And what happened with teaching is I had every year, there's at least one student who tells me they're considering ending their life. And I thought, if I'm not helping, if I'm hiding, then I'm not letting anybody else know. There are people who are alive and walking around on the planet who have felt this way and they've gotten through it. There is an other side. And so that's why I decided that I would interview myself and share that story. So what happened was my family. <laughs> so that was just home wasn't a happy place. And by this point, my brother who was, see if I'm 15, he's 12 and a half, he'd moved out. So that's why when people ask me if I have a brother, I have to remind myself that I do. He left home. We all did what we needed to do to protect ourselves. And my brother did what in hindsight was probably the smartest thing for him to do. Wow. I was there, but I was very alone. I'm pretty sure my mom was depressed because I, I remember her often being in her bedroom. <laughs> it's like you're going to spend hours in your bedroom. Something's not right. I knew how I wanted to do it. And I knew the one thing that one of the things that helped me not to do it was my plan involved riding my bicycle somewhere uh, to a certain point where I could make things happen but I would have to leave my bicycle there and somebody would steal, might steal it. And so I, which, which shouldn't have mattered if I was gone. But anyway, that was a part of the plan that kept me tethered to the earth. But there was a Sunday morning when I was lying in bed, it was about 10 o'clock. I couldn't think of a reason to get out of bed. I'm pretty sure I had my hands under my back because I did that sometimes because I thought I can't hurt myself if my hands are under my back. And I wasn't raised with any religion in my family. We did have Christmas trees, but that was about it. Oh, Easter bunny eggs. So I didn't pray or know how to pray or whatever prayer was, but I just lifted up my voice, looking up at the ceiling saying, is this the day I should take my exit? And then I heard music. I heard singing and I thought, uh oh, I have become mentally imbalanced. I've lost my mind. I need help. But then I realized my, I have my window is open. It's spring. My window's open and I'm hearing singing and it must be coming from that little church up the street. So my neighborhood was in a development that was newly carved out of a field and half a mile away was another neighborhood that had been there for 
I don't know, a couple hundred years. It's the oldest African-American settlement in New Jersey. And in that community, there is a little white church, white clapboard, steepled, and just how you picture Eastern churches. And we used to walk by it to get to the candy store. So you'd walk up my road, and then you'd walk down Church Lane, and then you'd get to Red Hill Road. And there was something about that singing that morning, and I just was drawn to it. And so I got out of bed and I'm going to put this in because I had slept in my clothes. (laughs) Oh, okay. okay, There were times I didn't change my clothes for days. But anyway, I walked up the hill, walked to the church and the church was set back in the woods. The community was boundaried by lots of trees. And I stood outside the church and I listened to the music and the church was in beautiful shape, pristine, well cared for. And there were a few very neat homes around it. But then the larger community was extremely impoverished. I mean, we say disinvested, but this was extreme poverty. And so I'm listening to the singing. And I think if the people in this church who have so little can find a reason to sing, then maybe there's a reason for me to stay alive. And I just don't know what it is yet. And that's when I made the commitment that I'm just going to stay alive until I figure out why I'm here. Because just because I don't know why now doesn't mean I won't know why later. And it wasn't like I had this big epiphany and I went, (laughs) aha, I'm healed or whatever. It was just more like taking a drink of water on a hot day. And there were other hot days when I went back and listened to that church. And I never went inside because I thought I would break the music. I would break the magic spell. But when I was an adult, I did go back and I spoke to the pastor and his wife and the congregation. And they were pretty amazed that half a mile away, you could hear them sing. Hmm. And that their singing saved you. I believe there are three things that saved me. Their singing, the dog I had at the time, and being outside. Because outside made sense to me. My house didn't make any sense to me at all. But outside made sense. Mm. So I can answer the why am I here? The answer is because I am. That's all the why anybody needs. I am. You are. We are. We're here. And as long as we're here, this is something actually, I don't know that I shared this when I spoke with Thomas on Mortality Minded, but my husband had PTSD and thoughts of suicide regularly. And there was a day when I was sitting in his dining room or kitchen table, whatever it was. And I looked up at, I was just so happy. The sun was up. It was just so good to be, this was, we weren't together yet. We were dating. I was at his house in Michigan and I was just so happy. I leaned back in the chair. I looked up at the ceiling and I saw the golden glint in the ceiling. And I said, what's that? And I had a feeling I knew what it was. So I stood on the chair and sure enough, it was a bullet. And he had been playing Russian roulette with his friend earlier that week. And he told his friend he didn't know why he was alive. And he put a bullet in the gun. And he said this way he could find out if he shot himself and he died, then he would know God didn't want him here. And his friend said, you don't have to shoot yourself. You can just shoot the ceiling. Then you'll know if God doesn't want you here. So I'm thankful to the friend. So Trent shot the ceiling and then was convinced that because a bullet came out, God didn't want him here. And I said to him, no kind of God that I know keeps you alive if God wants you dead. If he wanted you dead, you'd be dead already. And the fact that you're here is all the proof you need. And I still believe that if you're here, that's all the proof you need. You're here because I am. and That's enough. Mm -hmm. Which takes me to the question of legacy, the whole, what does it matter? Mm-hmm. As, as Lisa said in, in my last interview, it's none of my business. Yeah, it's none of my business. What does living a courageous life mean to you? To me, it's simple. It's being clear that there's something I am supposed to do, that I'm meant to do, and that even if it scares me, I do it anyway. Setting my fear to the side, not pretending it doesn't exist, not saying it's a bad thing or a wrong thing, just saying to my fear, got it? You're trying to keep me safe. 
and I'm going to go do this anyway. And what has stopped you in your life from pursuing your goals? Mostly self-doubt. The fact that I'm working on a novel is a form of honoring the self. I've always wanted to write something fiction. I wrote all the time at work. That was a big part of my job. And I've my blog is nonfiction. My memoir is obviously nonfiction. But I used to have this belief that people who can tell made-up stories are special, and I'm not special enough to be one of them. So I let go of that. And I said, okay, we're all special. And I'm going to show my specialness by being a writer. You are most definitely a writer. There's no question. Thank you. Yeah, and I look forward to what you create. Thank you. I do too. (laughs) It's been a long, long, it's been a great learning experience, but a long one. And what I learned is nonfiction and fiction are like two different things. They're like two different languages. And I didn't have that appreciation. I figured "Ah, I can just toss off writing no problem, but I can't toss off fiction. So it's been a big learning, but I've met a lot of people because of it. A lot of fun. And what other goals do you still want to achieve? I want to be more me. What does that mean? I mean that whatever it is that I am, I want to fully be it. I don't want to say, no, I can't do that, or that's not for me, or I want to allow myself to consider the possibility. And then if I think it's something I want to be, do, that I go do it or be it. And how will you do that? I don't know. (laughs) Honestly, I don't. I think it's mainly a matter of being aware of what I think or feel and listening to myself. But we'll see. What's essential to living a courageous life? Ooh. Well, you may or may not know (laughs) that I was in a deeply religious conservative church for about 10 years. And it was all because when I got out of my family, I didn't know how to be. And so I was looking for a place to tell me how to be. And so I found one (laughs) that told me a lot about how to be. And there's a verse that just popped into my mind that happens to me still occasionally. And the verse is, I don't know where it is, but it says, gird up your loins with strength. And I've been doing more exercises lately and really focusing on my core and my loins. And if you're going to step out, if you're going to step forward, if you're going to hold yourself up, you need a really strong core. If you're going to be courageous, you must gird up your loins with strength. Like that. What impact do you want to have on the world? You asked that question differently this time, and I wasn't ready for it. Hmm. But I like the way you asked it. Huh. I want my life to matter. And beyond that, I don't want to think about it. Because I've I spent so much of my time proving my worth or trying to earn my worth. And so I don't want to get caught up into, am I leaving enough of a legacy? And the answer is always going to be no, if I'm doing comparative studies. I'm not Michelle Obama. I'm not whatever. I'm me. And so I'm just going to focus on doing the things I believe I should be doing, girding up my loins with strength, standing in the arena, acting in the arena. It's okay if I get knocked over and I sit down in the dust in the arena, but I got to get back up again. And I will leave what impact I have on the planet and people in it up to the planet and people in it. Sounds like a great legacy. We'll see. I'm about two thirds done. (laughs) (laughs) What would you do on your last day? I would live the kind of day I live now. So I would get up in the morning and I would be happy and I would do my meditations and I would take a walk outside. And if it could be a magical last day, since it's my last one, I'd bring back my dog. We go for a walk. And then I come home, I'd write, I'd interact with some people online, I'd call my brother, I'd call my mom, and then I'd take a hot bath. Oh, and since it's my last day, I would also eat an entire pint of Grater's Black Raspberry Chip ice cream. Ooh. Uh Uh-huh. 
Is that a Cincinnati based ice cream company that we all need to fly to Cincinnati for? Yes and no. Yes, it's Cincinnati based, but no, you do not need to fly to Cincinnati because Whole Foods carries it. Oh, okay. I wonder if they carry it in Canada as well. Hmm. I don't know, but I highly recommend their black raspberry chip. It's their number one seller. Damn. Okay. (laughs) Yeah. Might need to make a special trip to Whole Foods and leave my credit card behind. But anyway. Yeah, exactly. That sounds amazing. Any final thoughts you'd like to share? Why, yes, Linda. Uh Oh, she, as she reaches for her notes. <laughs> yes. Oh, dear. Okay. No, this is so good because what happened? A miracle occurred. Actually, I used to have a college professor, the professor who taught human anatomy. And he said, he'd be talking about embryonic development and they go, and then a miracle occurs. So anyway, a miracle occurs. So my last guest on my podcast suggested listening to another podcast. And the reason I wanted to bring it up with you is because I don't know about you. I want to check this out with you. But I just started my podcast thinking it was a good idea and thinking that somehow these conversations were maybe useful. I don't know. I don't know. Did you have more? of? In- you might have had more insight. I, I, n- no, I, I didn't. I really didn't know what I was getting into, which is exactly the best way to get into it, because you probably wouldn't start if you did have any <laughs> idea what you were getting into. Yeah, no kidding. But this podcast tells you and me that what we are doing is important. Mm. The podcast is Politicology. The guest is Celeste Headley, H-E-A-D-L-E-E. It's the March 3rd episode. And she talked about a few things that I went, that's cool. So three things. One, listening isn't something you do for the other person. When you listen to somebody else, it's changing you. It's developing empathy in you. And I found that with my podcast and I see you nodding. So that surprised me. Two, when you listen to somebody empathically, your brain waves and their brain waves sync up exactly and you can see it on an fMRI. Okay, then this quote. I will close with this quote. The mind meld on a level that occurs when you have an empathic bond between people based on the human voice. Mic drop. That's what they said on the podcast. <laughs> she said that like, and the and yes, she said that and the host said mic drop. We can stop now. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. Thank you for this. Thank you, Linda. I've really appreciated, felt honored. I don't know what to say. I just want to say thank you. You're welcome. That quote that you shared is is so perfect because so many times I've felt that just bearing witness to the stories. Bearing uh, witness. Mm -hmm. Is a profoundly changing experience. It is. Thank you for bearing witness for me today. And also, according to that quote, increasing your own empathy. (laughs) (laughs) thank you for listening i will share a link to jules website in the show notes where you can find more information about her wonderful podcast hard times and hope her book sweet baby lover and of course her blog please follow or subscribe to this podcast and if you feel someone else might benefit from listening to this episode please share it leave a rating or review wherever you listen to your podcasts including YouTube. Next week, I'll be wrapping up season two, then taking a short break to prepare for season three. I'd love to hear from you what stories have been impactful and what other kinds of stories you'd like to hear. Feel free to reach out to me via my website or email, both available in the show notes. Until next time, my name is Linda McLaughlin in The Arena. <laughs>